So I'm going to give very brief introductions to our panelists, and then we'll dive into questions. Obviously, we're behind schedule. I was hoping to leave some time for your all's questions, and I'll, I'll still try to do that if the schedule allows. Um, so starting to uh, my left, we have Matt Shears, who's the Vice President of Law and Policy at the Computer and Communications Industry Association. We have George York. Thank you. George York, the Senior Vice President of International Policy at the Recording Industry Association of America, coming off a big night with the Grammys. Um, we have Damian Levy, who's the Head of Trade and Agriculture for the Embassy of the European Union. And then finally, at the end, Rob Tanner, who's the Director for Digital Trade at the US Trade Representative. So thank them all for uh, taking the time to uh, come today and speak with us. I want to hit on several topics. Um, and perhaps makes the most sense, though, to start with NAFTA, since the latest round of negotiations have wrapped up in Montreal. Um, we'll start at the end, if we could, with Robert, which is, you know, when it comes to NAFTA, what, what can you tell us about the state of digital trade and e-commerce provisions, you know, with NAFTA and, and how those stand as far as the negotiations are concerned? Sure. Thanks, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, this is a much bigger turnout than we had in the other room, so I'm glad we moved. <laughs> um, you know, I think it, it, we are we are obviously in the middle of those negotiations, and so I think we're definitely we've made good progress. Um, uh, I, I'm and myself and my colleague Jonathan McHale are working on the telecommunications and digital trade chapters, and I think you know we're we're essentially still in the middle of of trying to pursue a, a pretty robust and ambitious agenda. Uh, so the, I think the last round uh, was very positive and, and definitely progress was made, um, but you know, still some work to do. Well, that's I think one of the themes we heard coming out of the, the latest rounds was more progress. Can you tell us at all how far apart the countries are on things like digital trade or, or e-commerce? Uh, you know, it's hard to get into specifics because you are in the middle of, of, of a negotiation. Um, I mean, I think, you know, by and large, there is a fairly common vision among the three countries in terms of trying to have uh, a chapter on digital trade that is liberalizing and has strong commitments. And as well in telecommunications, I mean, the original NAFTA has a telecommunications chapter that was essentially negotiated before, well, not only well before the internet, but before there was actually like, competition in telecommunications in most countries. So full sort of modernizing that and bringing that into sort of the way things work now. Again, I think the countries share, uh, you know, a pretty common vision, common interest in trying to achieve that. Great, thank you. Um, I want to come over to Matt if I could, which is one of the a couple of the issues that I know have been top of mind for many tech and telecom companies has been cross-border data flows. Um, you know, that's something that we many want to see sort of enshrined in NAFTA and then used in future trade negotiations. Um, what are your sort of expectations in terms of you know where we might end up or where you might like to end up when it comes to you know, cross-border data flows and some of these concerns around the movement of information over borders. Sure. So, uh, you know, I think we'd like to end up in a place where there is uh, a pretty consistent, uh, reliable uh, system under which businesses can do uh, trade and services across the Atlantic. Uh, from the United States perspective, that's critical. We're increasingly a services exporter and uh, some of the fastest areas of growth in our services exports are actual digital services. And so we want to ensure that there's a market for that. Um, and whether it's in North America or Europe, uh, increasingly we also see that a lot of our trading partners have small and medium-sized enterprises that, that rely on those services that, we're, uh, that our companies, that our industries are exporting uh, to reach international markets, to become uh, a multinational, even though you're a, a small, medium-sized enterprise. So, uh, you know, there's um, the, the, the end game, I think, is where is, uh, there's consensus about where we want to be, that these services can be uh, freely traded. There's something like $260 billion in trade at, work, uh, at stake in, in just in the transatlantic relationship. Uh, and, and I think similar numbers uh, through North America. And so we're uh, very in ho hopeful uh, and interested that we can uh, establish some common rules of the road that will provide for U.S. businesses to access markets and for customers in those markets to, to utilize our services to serve their customers. And do you see NAFTA as an opportunity to kind of set a, set a standard that future trade agreements will be held against, both bilateral but also these multinational trade agreements? Well, I think it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know that it's uh, prudent to say we're just going to, you know, this is going to be our one time and we're going to set a benchmark now. If you look, uh, our uh, understanding of what uh, rules and frameworks we need uh, 
uh, in, in trade have grown over time. Um, as Rob was pointing out, uh, the, the telecoms chapter in NAFTA dates from the early 90s. When you think about when that tech started coming together, it was, it was probably in the late 80s. Uh, it certainly predates all the companies that I represent and most of the services that folks out in the room are, are, are typing away on and using right now. And so uh, obviously we have a lot, uh, we have a lot just to bring ourselves up to the current date to provide frameworks for the uh, trade and services that we're, we're conducting now. Uh, but it's also going to be uh, a process of iteration and improvement over time. And so certainly what goes into NAFTA will be critical, but also we're going to have to recognize that this is an area that is going to develop uh, over time and we'll realize we need new, new disciplines and new priorities and protections uh, as, as time passes. Got it. Um, but George, I'd like to come to you next, which is, and, and ask you, the creative industries sort of always have intellectual property and copyright top of mind, right? It's very fundamental to the businesses you represent. Um, where do you think, when it comes to, um, you know, IP and copyright in NAFTA particularly, you know, we've often seen a more enforcement-driven approach, and some folks in tech particularly have sort of pushed back against that and wanted to see maybe more liberal rules. Um, where, sort of where, where do you stand on that, and what do you expect might come out of these these rounds of negotiations. Thanks a lot. Um, so look, we, we are extremely supportive, first of all, of the NAFTA modernization effort. Um, and it's something we very much hope is successful. Um, and I think consistent among all the speakers that you're going to hear today, we see a lot of uh, real potential upside, both in terms of our industries that we represent, the nations who we, who we work for, um, but also for sort of our respective job creation, trade competitiveness, and other aspects that um, contribute to our economic growth. Um, so for our industry specifically, I, I would like to sort of start with a slightly different premise, which is we, we are very um, supportive of digital trade, a strong, inclusive digital trade policy from the United States and obviously likewise with from the European Union and from other uh, key markets around the world. So there we share with respect to data flows, cross-border restrictions on services, um, digital trade uh, product discrimination, tariffs on digital trade products. You know, we're probably in the same place uh, that many of the other people in the room are who, who are up to speed on some of these NAFTA uh, trade disciplines. So there we're very supportive and we see that as very important for creative sectors in the United States who rely heavily on copyright, but not to the exclusion of other critical disciplines. So we support Rob's uh, efforts uh, profoundly in most areas of the digital trade chapter. Likewise, in the intellectual property chapter, to your kind of specific question, obviously strong copyright is critical for us. It's what allows us to license our work uh, to uh, about 40 million tracks to about close to 400 digital platforms around the world. And that is for us what allows the, a digital trade policy, a digital trade economy to be both inclusive and sustainable, right? We wanted to promote legitimate trade in legitimate goods and services or legitimate digital products, which a sound recording is. It's really critical that sound recordings are, uh, are part of the digital trade outcome, and that would include streaming, right? The streaming economy in the United States is critical and growing and growing. Right now, close to two-thirds of the recording industry revenues are streaming, and we, it's really important for us. We've chatted with this uh, to Rob, and this is true in many other markets globally, that streaming is critical not just for the recording industry, not just for the movie industry, but so many industries around the world. It's an emerging area where we have tremendous commonality between um, technology companies and music companies, which have become themselves technology companies. So the, the answer is IP is critical to us, as are other trade disciplines, which helps to reinforce um, legitimate digital trade. And so when you think about you know, what IP looks like in the new NAFTA in terms of modernization, because as you mentioned, you know, when the first NAFTA was written, we didn't have music streaming. We didn't have all of the services that we have now. The industry looks very different. So in a NAFTA 2.0, what, what do we need to have in place? You know, how do, how do the rules, how does the language look different, you know, compared to what we, what we have in the first agreement? It's a great question. So obviously with the advent of 
digital trade and e-commerce, um, specific copyrights are going to be uh, especially prevalent, as are, as are additional protections that we've seen in many other trade agreements as well. So it's not a fundamental departure. But obviously, the communication to the public right and the making available right, and apologies for the minutia on copyright. Matt will enjoy it, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure everyone will. Um, but uh, so those are critical technological protection measures, which are basically the encryptions and other securities that facilitate legitimate, secure digital trade, right? So that's how uh, credit card transactions work. That's how the cloud works. You have to rely on these te technological protection measures, which we also rely on in the movie industry, the video game industry for us, in the sound recording industry, to ensure that access to copyright protected content is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is protected. And all of this, of course, is happening in a manner that's consistent with U.S. law. For us, the bottom line has to be, and we all have to say this talking point, um, but the bottom line has to be that any provision in a trade agreement in NAFTA has to be consistent with U.S. law, and it has to also be applied in a manner consistent with its original intent. Um, and so we'll have different views about what that means, but certainly that's a, common, uh, a point of common commonality between all of us. Great. Um, well, Damien, and we're going we're gonna to talk quite a bit about European trade as well. Um, but I do want to ask you a question on NAFTA because you're watching these NAFTA negotiations as a non-participant. Um, what have you gleaned about sort of the Trump administration's policy and uh, policy priorities and approach to trade negotiations from watching these these talks as, uh, from the outside? Well, first of all, um, we decided to renegotiate our free trade agreement with Mexico before the Trump administration decided to renegotiate NAFTA. So we fully understand you need to update and modernize all trade agreements. And if you want to know what we are negotiating with Mexico, it's all public. So you go on the website of the commission, you go under DigiTrade and Transparency, and all the texts are, are available, including on e-commerce, IPR, and all that. So you, you, you can know precisely what we are uh, striving. And it's actually very modern. It's, it's up to date. Uh, in a number of areas, we ask for more. We are more ambitious. In some areas, we're still not able to ask for more on, on, on data flows, for example. Uh, I'll come back to that later, if you wish. But so I think, one, it's only normal you modernize the trade agreement. Two, I'd like to remind other people that the EU is in the top three seller and buyer of goods and services of any of the NAFTA countries. Um, and we are the number one foreign investor in the United States and number one or number two in Canada and Mexico. So we're not directly involved, but we have a huge stake and our companies have a huge stake. So anything that can improve the integration of the North American market is good for uh, our companies as well. In terms of the, the policy areas, we'll be watching you know, what they renegotiate and uh, we'll um, look at that. And if, if Canada and Mexico agree to, to what the United States is asking, well, we'll take stock of that. In the meantime, we have our agreement with Canada, which just entered into force last September, and we hope to conclude with Mexico very soon, at least political deal, and, uh, and then we'll see. And so you maybe touched on this a bit, but you know, do you feel that the negotiations with NAFTA sort of lack a transparency or a visibility for, for those on the outside looking in? And, you know, a negotiator might say, well, you don't show your hand in a negotiation, right? But, but what, do you, what do you make of that question? Listen, I, I mean, I respect the policy of the United States government. I would simply say that we've taken, and Miriam Sapio here remembers when she was deputy USTR, uh, also in charge of TTIP, we decided to publish our own texts not in market access, which is really the area where, from our perspective, you need to keep your cards very close to your chest, you know, which tariff line you're going to give, which government entities you're going to give in government procurement, and in services the same. But apart from that, since <coughs> trade agreements cover many areas which are of interest for citizens in your everyday life, and they are concerned, we decided to be much more transparent in our trade negotiations. And so you can look on the web and compare what we are trying to do in EU Indonesia, EU Mexico, which is the same, what we've done in EU Japan or in EU Vietnam, and what we've done in the past in EU Singapore, or EU Canada, or EU Korea, if you want. So you, you can compare and you, you can see the evolution. We think it's, uh, it's necessary for legitimacy of public <coughs> policy, of trade policy, sorry, in the European Union, where there was, this was questioned, and people say, oh, these deals are negotiated in private. We don't trust these negotiators, so now we decided to,
publish the, those, uh, the text and to be much more transparent on the outcomes of every negotiating round. And Rob, I'd love to get kind of your reaction to that, that idea and question of, you know, how much, how much transparency is good and necessary, given that this is the government negotiating on behalf of the American people versus, you know, a certain degree of sort of s secrecy, you know, as you're trying to get th the best deal possible, so to speak. Yeah, and I certainly appreciate Damien's, you know, mentioning that there are different systems and he, and he respects our system. I think likewise, I mean, it's uh, countries can take... Uh, different approaches to this. I think the U.S. is is quite transparent in the sense that we do um, we do work with the Congressional Trade Promotion Authority. We put out fairly detailed objectives in terms of what we're trying to achieve, which I think is is very clear in terms of what the U.S. is trying to accomplish. Uh, and I think that is the the balance, which is to say you you need the uh, ability to negotiate with your partners a uh, language that maximizes what everybody wants. I think we are guided by those objectives. Uh, and, you know, the process that we have in terms of leading into any negotiation also relies pretty extensively on both public comment proceeding, uh, but also very extensive uh, consultation process. Um, some of that is with cleared advisors, but certainly there is the opportunity uh, for the public to talk to USTR, and that, I think, is, is sort of the way we, we ensure both transparency, but also make sure that we are responsive to what the public is seeking for us to do in NAFTA. Um, and I guess I just follow up on some of the other comments. I mean, I appreciate George's comments as well. I think that is certainly uh, important. The digital trade chapter encompasses a number of uh, disciplines that we're proposing that I think are of great benefit, not just to what you would think of as technology companies, but also content uh, sort of owners and companies that are interested in, in, in working with content owners. But frankly, also, you know, it's, it's, it's important to lots and lots of companies and lots and lots of sectors. So I think most of the folks here probably fully appreciate that. You know, when you talk about um, ensuring essentially open access to markets for cloud computing services and sort of cloud computing functionality, so we pursue uh, you know, trade commitments around data flows and against localization requirements. That's as important to an insurance company as to John Deere, as to car companies, as it is to George's companies and, and Matt's uh, trade association. And so, uh, you know, it, 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 there is a lot of input that goes into this, uh, but the, the, the ideas, the concepts we're pursuing in digital trade have a pretty broad impact. Well, one of those um, sort of provisions that has a broad impact I wanted to talk about specifically is sort of intermedi intermediary liability and sort of what in the U.S. we have Section 230 of, of CDA. Um, I know that's something that many in tech consider to be sort of sacred scripture of the Internet, um, a foundational principle that, you know, the, you know is constantly under siege, um, depending on who you talk to. So uh, for... Um, for George and for Matt, first, I'd love to get kind of your take on, you know, do you want to see Section 230-like or Section 230 language exact in in NAFTA? And um, I guess, you know, why, why not? And do you think that's realistic? Sure. Um, so I, the question here, uh, just trying to step away from the, the legalese of Section 230, is, is whether we want our trading partners to adopt the sort of intermediary protection framework that the United States did in the, the late 90s that has uh, been one of the cornerstones of the, the internet uh, economic success that we've seen. Um, and, and you could kind of look at that cynically. And in fact, I've seen some folks say, well, you know, if other countries want to shoot their internet economy in the foot, why should we stop them? Uh, but that's precisely the wrong way to think about it because of the, the shared interests that we have that I was describing before. Uh, if you look across major internet firms, increasingly six or seven out of ten of their customers are overseas. These are, are huge exporters uh, of the United States. They contribute positively, immensely to our trade balance. So we want to provide uh, new markets into which they can provide their services. And, and as I was saying before, they're increasingly inputs into a lot of businesses that, that then use internet services to export. So it's a win-win. There's a, a shared interest in, in solving this problem. Uh, and you know, in the scope of U.S. law, we're always, as I think as everyone says, we're always very conscious to try and promote the U.S. law abroad, but there's often parts of U.S. law that have been left behind, and this is one very critical example. Uh, 
And so we increasingly see in foreign markets a sort of a, a shoot the messenger approach, where if somebody does something bad online, uh, it may be harder to find the, the bad actor, and so instead uh, governments will choose to, to penalize the intermediaries who are providing the service, and that makes a very difficult market to do business in. So it, 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 it's an in impediment to market access, and similarly, it then denies critical inputs to those, the local businesses that might want to use those services. So we want to get to a place where, where businesses can provide services into a market without uh, being subjected to liability for, for misconduct to users. Uh, and, and it's important to remember that 230 is a good Samaritan law, and the idea is, is that by, by limiting intermediaries' uh, uh, liability, they actually have much more flexibility to go out and police content. Uh, you know, right now there's a, in some markets there's a fear if you, you catch 99 instances of misconduct but miss the hundredth, you, you'll be blamed for having looked at all the others. Uh, and it creates this perverse disincentive to stick your head in the sand and, and don't look at all. Uh, a 230 like approach that has a, a good Samaritan regime would uh, allow intermediaries to try and police, uh, build tools, build systems. To, to prevent misconduct on platforms uh, and, and thereby enter markets and provide these services to, to customers that we do business with. And it's, it was a, a critical success here in the United States, I think, as you pointed out. And increasingly, that's, uh, that's important in the markets overseas that U.S. services are, are trying to do business in. Well, if I could play just quick devil's advocate and ask a follow-up on that. You know, there's the argument that because it gives this leeway, you know, that companies therefore have the ability to be selective about what they enforce and sort of when they enforce it. And so I guess my question is, you know, if I'm a foreign government, do I give that much leeway to, you know, a U.S. tech corporation? Um, and, and does that create problems for me potentially down the road? Well, I, you know, I think it, I mean, you characterize it in a very accurate way. There's, there's often, I think, very much a sense of why should we uh, provide protections to these, these foreign companies, right, who, who are doing business here. Uh, and as I explained, I think that's totally the wrong approach, right? That you, it's ultimately, one, you're suppressing your own domestic market from, uh, from developing, but you're also denying your own customers the benefits of those services because they're going to move to invest in markets where uh, the liability regime is, is one that's more manageable. But from a policy standpoint, I think it's also important to recognize that as businesses grow, they, they want to be a clean, well-lit place, and so larger businesses can invest more and more resources in, in policing content, devi developing services to uh, protect against misuse. Uh, but that's going to scale, right? A, a garage startup isn't going to be able to uh, develop a, a, a $50 million uh, content moderation system, which, in fact, the vast majority of larger services have done this. Right? So the, a, a Good Samaritan framework provides a certain amount of flexibility for companies' uh, solutions to grow as they grow while still providing the services to, to customers abroad. <clears throat> well, look, I uh, uh, very much agree with Matt's point on the importance of responsibility online and, and different incentives for, for achieving that. Certainly responsibility or responsible Internet is, is critical, as we've seen in so much of what's in the news today uh, in, in virtually every, in every respect. Um, I think, again, my, my thoughts on this issue will be similar to those with respect to the DMCA issues, though that's the copyright safe harbor in the IP chapter as opposed to the non-copyright safe harbor potentially in the, in the digital trade chapter in NAFTA. And so personally, I would say the first critical tenets of any provision in a trade agreement must again be that it is, that is fully reflective and consistent of our law. And so the challenge of any trade agreement, and, and for all those who have been in, involved in that process, it's, it's, it's difficult to get it right. How much should be there? How much can you put in a trade agreement language that may that has to be in U.S. law, but how much of that U.S. law, which can go on for pages and have court decisions and a whole jurisprudence around it, um, it becomes complicated. It's a complicated exercise. So obviously, um, prudence is there with respect to the drafting of the provision that it must be consistent with that U.S. law. Um, and obviously, we would always want to be sure, and we've seen versions of the language in the TISA negotiations, for example, where we have some questions about consistency with law. And then second of all, again, it must be um, applied in a manner consistent with the intent, right? And there's a lot of discussions right now in Congress, as Congress is currently actively engaged in reviewing this law in a particular, with respect to a particular uh, issue, um, uh, uh, very much a critical human rights issue, um, where Congress is actively engaged in, in reviewing and potentially amending this law. 
And so there is a, a prudential question about the, the uh, engaging in a trade negotiation, given the timing of legislative processes and the tri timing of trade negotiations. And again, we're, we're very hopeful about the, the, the NAFTA modernization effort, um, where one may be inconsistent with the other. And I think given, given that, typically in trade agreements, there's been a, been a I would say, a, a certain amount of prudence that's involved in terms of negotiating trade provisions where the U.S. law that those tri provisions are based on is actively being considered for amendment. And so, Rob, for to sort of close out our, our NAFTA conversation, when it comes to sort of in, this intermediary, intermediary liability, which is a mouthful question, um, and sort of these Section 230-like provisions, how committed is the U.S. to either the current, you know, Section 230 language or, or to getting that principle embedded in, in a, you know, a modernized NAFTA? And we're, we're done with NAFTA after this? Yeah. Sure? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, going, we're going to Europe. I don't know if okay. that's less or more complicated. Um, well, look, I mean, I think, you know, it's difficult for me to get into the details of being in the middle of this project, but we are pursuing you know, trade provisions that would be consistent with U.S. law. And so I, I certainly wouldn't disagree with any of the points that George and Matt made. Um, as with all of the provisions that we negotiate that affect services, you know, we, we ensure that there is sufficient flexibility that we can, uh, we can address public policy goals. So it's, that's, you know, th there is a devil in the details, but that is certainly something we're, we're pursuing. Excellent. Um, well, now I do want to make my way across the pond and, and talk Europe if we could. And again, I'm, we'll try to leave time for questions, um, so have those in mind. If, and if not, um, you know, feel free to ask the panelists afterward if they're around sure. and willing. Um, but <laughs> so I want to start off, and Damien, I'll start off with you. I'd like to read a quote from President Trump, who was speaking with Piers Morgan about trade with the European Union. Um, this was on Sunday. He said, quote, I've had a lot of problems with the European Union, and it may morph into something very big from that standpoint, from a trade standpoint. We cannot get our product in. It's very, very tough. And yet they send their products to us, no taxes, very little taxes. It's very unfair, was end quote. So I, I want to start with you getting sort of your, I guess, either response to that quote specifically or the idea more broadly of a disparity and, and an unfair arrangement between the U.S. and the EU when it comes to trade and, you know, if, to the extent it exists with digital trade specifically. Thank you. Um, you know, when the president was in Davos, he delivered, I think, a very interesting speech. And if you read the part on trade, we probably would agree with everything he said. Um, and so I think we prefer to focus on, on, on that um, pronouncement, if I can say. Um, now, his interview with ITV is a British uh, channel and probably aimed at the British audience. So. Um, that's how I read some of his comments also on Brexit, uh, which were not for an EU audience or EU27. On, on trade, um, you know, the tariffs of the United States and the tariffs of the European Union are roughly the same, slightly higher here, slightly higher there. They are the result of longstanding agreements, uh, which, you know, we fought very hard for in the US as well. And so I think it's the result of a negotiation. And we, for the moment, export more than the U.S. does uh, for a number of reasons, I guess. We don't think trade is a zero-sum game. We, we, we think it's win-win. And um, there are areas where we have higher tariffs. Areas here where the tariffs are higher take um, uh, mini trucks, uh, light commercial vehicles. The tariff is here 25 percent. It's about 10 percent in Europe. You'll find tariffs on our side which, where the tariffs are higher for beef. And in a trade negotiation, you negotiate concessions. And so you lower your tariffs there, I lower my tariffs there, and you come to a, to a lower uh, outcome, which is good for both. And so um, I'd say that's, um, that's the whole idea of negotiations. It's win-win. It cannot be I win, you lose uh, in a negotiation. That's how we look at international trade agreements. And in digital trade, I think the United States is a big exporter of a number of services. We export some other services. We're actually the largest exporter of services worldwide. And so we are very, uh, very much engaged in trade negotiations worldwide with more than 10 countries, actually 15 if you add Mercosur as four countries. And so we want to promote um, our exports and make sure our companies have a higher share of a growing market. You know, 95% of future world uh, growth is outside Europe. 
Um, and so we want to make sure companies have a bigger share of that growing market in a way. And, and for Rob then, you know, are there specifically again to, to digital, given that that's the, the focus of our panel discussion today, are there areas of trade currently with Europe around, around digital or policies around digital trade that USTR might view as sort of unfair or needing, needing review to be, to be more balanced? You know, I mean, I think <clears throat> in general, you know, we're, we're pursuing NAFTA. We're looking at other bilateral discussions. Um, part of that is, is assessing the relationship with the EU. I mean, I think our overall objective in, in digital trade as others is a, is a fair and equitable trade. And so um, nothing that I would flag as specific. I mean, it is sort of part of a process of evaluation. We do pay a lot of attention to Europe. I mean, it is a, it is a big market. Uh, and there are a number of things that Europe is engaged in in terms of internal reforms that, you know, we are very interested in and follow, uh, both because in a lot of cases we think it's very good in terms of policy changes, but also to make sure that we, you know, it happens in a way that facilitates trade between Europe and the outside. Uh, so it, that's basically, you know, our, our view of Europe right now. If I, if I can add, um, because you may not know this, because um, on Thursday, I believe, we have an annual meeting of the Information Society Dialogue. So U.S. government officials and European Commission officials will be meeting, discussing the state of play of the digital single market, um, the net neutrality debate here, the copyright reform uh, uh, debate on our side, and some further uh, um, uh, topics. So actually, we, we meet every year. And if you go back to the past, um, USTR and the Commission uh, agreed on ICT principles, you remember? Uh, 2011, if I recall. So those were kind of common principles we were trying to um, push or trying to make sure other countries, third countries, would agree. For example, that a telecom regulatory agency should be independent, just to give you one example, or a, a number of other things. So we've been working on ICT issues and uh, data flows, e-commerce, for a very long time, actually. And so TTIP is where it is. We are f both focusing on other issues, but we're very much pursuing uh, similar goals, I would say, for the moment, yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask um, toward the end of the conversation, but I'll, I'll ask it now since you brought it up, which is what, what are the prospects for a revival of more direct trade talks between the European Union and the U.S.? Obviously, both are focused on other things at the moment, but I think there are many who, who sort of see opportunities to, to revisit those conversations that have maybe lapsed a bit. You know, I, I think... I would say we're we're certainly evaluating it, and I think beyond that, it's difficult for me to say. Maybe Damien has us more clarity on on his views. No, um, no. I think in any event, you would need to have a high level conversation whether it's worth relaunching, and to n part of the conversation would be what's the purpose of trade agreements? Is it to rebalance trade deficits? Then we are not interested. It, is it to um, create win-win solutions for both sides? Um, then we are interested. But if it's just focused on trade deficits, I would be very surprised if anyone in Europe would say, yeah, let's resume TTIP because we want to make sure we manage trade and we lower um, uh, deficit or increase the surplus. I, I, I don't think that would be the approach uh, followed in Brussels. But I'm only expressing my own personal views here. Well, I want to add one thing, too, which is not uh, the bilateral discussion, but the, at the WTO, at the last ministerial in Buenos Aires, you know, the EU and the U.S. were among a number of countries that uh, supported the essentially discussion on e-commerce. Yeah. And so in terms of what we've been talking about and many of these issues, <clears throat> we certainly hope that is a, a forum where we'll be able to work with the EU in moving forward on that. Is, is there the potential to work on work on more specific niche issues like an e-commerce or other other digital trade, sort of move the ball on those, so to speak, as opposed to doing a wholesale kind of trade trade talk? Well, absolutely. There's there's the opportunity to to have those discussions around e-commerce at the WTO. Uh, I think we're all actually quite looking forward to 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 rolling up sleeves on that. Um, you know. Where that will go, it's a little early to say. I mean, we're, it's January. It's been about, about less than a month. But I, I do expect that we will, we will meet and we will we'll have substantive talks this year on that. Great. Um, well, I want to come, come back to our, our industry representatives over here. And so for Matt and George, when you look at Europe, you know, which is 
a big market for the companies that um, you you work with and, and work for, but also, you know, has some some perils and some open questions, in ter particularly around things like privacy and sort of m more protectionist ideas that have been floated in certain parts of Europe. What what stands out to you at right now as sort of the biggest concern and then potentially biggest opportunity for your for your respective companies? And we'll start with Georgia. If we Great. <clears throat> I think I think you've put it exactly right of of, of a market of tremendous uh, tremendous opportunity, uh, but also tremendous. Um, not just potential, but tremendous actual to date, right? So we, we see in, in, in Europe in many ways, uh, in, in key member states and at the European Commission and European Union level, um, a correlation between strong IP protection, <laughs> Uh, both that's copyright, but that's that's very much across the board, um, and then the importance of digital trade, right? And we see a correlation between the two, um, and obviously it's a sophisticated regime. It's a, a unique regime reflecting the European uh, assessment of these critical issues, but. Digital trade, uh, the key driver of digital trade in the, for the U.S. exports and surplus is intellectual property rights licensing, right? So in last year, um, 80 billion in surplus. It's the second largest category of total, total digital services surplus in the United States were from IP licensing. So that's patents, that's copyright, that's audiovisual, that's movies and music. Uh, and other things. Um, so we see that as driving, so you have this IP licensing second only to travel and tourism services. So second largest exports out of the United States of digital services trade at 125 billion, right? And we see that a lot of that going to the European Union where we have a surplus uh, in these specific areas, um, in part because they do have, they do afford these strong protections. We're also quite supportive of the European Commission's proposals with respect to their own domestic law on the EU copyright directive. Um, so we see uh, tremendous uh, both actual and potential there. Likewise, um, I think one issue that we, um, that Damien and I were chatting about before the discussion started was the European uh, GDPR, uh, General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, there's some concern as an unintended consequence, perhaps, of the implementation of that regulation, which has been longstanding, <clears throat> that it may impair access to registrant data Right, that has long been public, which has been used for legitimate public policy purposes of law enforcement, um, cybersecurity for cybersecurity personnel, and then also by rights holders. ICANN, um, the Internet Corporation for Names and Numbers, I've sign, forgotten something. Sign names and numbers. Yeah, um, uh, is currently uh, working on a policy about, about co uh, compliance with the GDPR, and we're quite. Uh, f tracking quite closely how that will evolve, and I think there's actually a lot of common ground between uh, many stakeholder communities in the United States about where that should come out. Um, so we're quite hopeful that the European Union will be able to have some kind of uh, clarification about how the GDPR would be applied with respect to this who is data, registrant data, um, uh, in, a, in a specific way. So, uh, yeah, I guess continuing the theme, there's uh, a lot of opportunity, as I was saying before, uh, Europe is a very large market for the export of digital services, but that is a win-win because those services are you know, so frequently inputs into other, our trading partners' exports, which make their exports more competitive, right? And these are the kinds of make the pie bigger opportunities we, we want to look for. Uh, I think there is, as, as George said, there's uh, across industry, there are anxieties about the potential uh, implementation uh, ramifications of GDPR and uh, the, the risk of, of unintended consequences, particularly for, I think, again, smaller firms uh, that may not have the, the capacity or, or even the awareness to, uh, the, to understand what kinds of compliance they need to do. Uh, and, and insofar as that compliance burden is a, is a fixed cost, it falls uh, the hardest on small businesses that don't have a large consumer base to distribute that cost across. Uh, so that's a that, that's a, a I think a um, uh, a situation that, that that will require continued monitoring. Certainly, there's no no doubt that that privacy protection is a critical, uh, important, and desirable regulatory objective. How one goes about it, of course, is uh, what what some I think what we're talking about here. Um, I guess another issue. Um, so I was referring to uh, intermediary protections having been the cornerstone of the, the U.S. market. The European Union in 2000 in the, the e-commerce directive also has a, a horizontal intermediary, a sort of a don't, 
don't shoot the messenger rule, which provides a, a certain amount of shared responsibility, uh, limiting liability while also expecting intermediaries to try and maintain a, a clean, well-lit place. Um, and uh, in the context of the DSM, uh, I think there's been some suggestions, uh, potential proposals that could, you know, upset those protections. Uh, the DSM, I'm sorry, being the digital single market, which is also, I think, a very laudable objective, the idea of trying to create uh, one unitary European market into which digital goods and services can be provided instead of a, a bunch of silos. Uh, unifying that market would uh, provide great value to, to European consumers, but also businesses that want to enter that market and, and know that there's one framework that they can comply with. Uh, one set of rules that they should understand. Uh, and so we're enthusiastic about the concept. Again, there's you know, concerns about implementation. What if, uh, you know, in, in implementing this framework, the liability rules are upset in a way that, again, particularly smaller businesses can't, uh, can't comply with. It's going to, f you know, form an unintended barrier to, to market entry for those, those kinds of services. Damien, do you want to respond to some of those concerns about the unintended consequences and, and also the, um, the, the idea of potentially, you know, policies within either EU as a whole or parts of it that might s seem like protectionism, you know? There are, there are many questions in your question. Um, <laughs> first of all... And limited time, I know. Yeah. Uh, first of all, on data privacy, I think it's important to re realize that it's, it's a constitutional law debate. It's a, it's a human right issue. It's not a regulatory objective. It's a human right issue. It's like your First Amendment debates. Um, and it, the reason for that is uh, a number of, I would say even the majority of the European Union member states have been uh, under totalitarian regimes. And when you are in a totalitarian regime, you want to protect your data privacy, your, your own personal data. And so once you've been freed of those regimes, um, and you know, it was not only the Eastern European uh, countries under communist uh, uh, regimes, but also uh, you had dictatorships in, in Spain, Portugal, and Greece. And so um, a lot of European Union citizens really want to consider their privacy, the uh, privacy of their data, personal data, as a fundamental right. And so that explains, I think, the, um, the importance of the debate. Also, the reluctance to um, mingle these issues with trade agreements. Now, on the, the GDPR, the, the new rules that will uh, enter into force on May 25th, a couple of points. One, it will lower the fixed costs because instead of having 28 different laws on privacy, on data privacy, you, you will have only one. So if you're an SME, you want to export your services and Today, everybody does it. You put it on the web, and anyone from the 28 and broader buys your stuff. So you don't need to hire data privacy lawyers from Germany, Italy, Spain, and so forth. You, if you're in France, you just hire one lawyer, who sh because there'll be one rule book, basically. There'll be one authority with which you check your rules and your, your protocols and whether that's OK. Uh, so there'll be a lot of benefits. And for the citizens as well, there'll be a lot of benefits from the GDPR. I don't have time to go into that. Now, there are unintended consequences or unforeseen things when you adopt laws. I mean, that's the nature of a law, you know, and uh, the authorities and the experts are dealing with them. And, and I think if you have any new issue that you've discovered or your members have discovered, tell it to the European Commission experts, uh, raise it with the data protection authorities in the relevant member states, and they'll deal with it, they'll, they'll address it. I mean, obviously, we're moving from a situation with uh, law uh, enforcement from the perspective of no fines or very little fines. There was enforcement, as we know, but there was, the, I, mean, I think, the pecuniary element of the deterrence wasn't much there. So now we're moving to a, a, a different uh, a world. I think the authorities are very much aware of that, um, and the Commission as well. Great. Um, well, unfortunately, I, we do have a very hard stop at 225, so I'd like to thank our panelists um, for being here, and thank you all for coming. I hope this was informative. Um, uh, I apologize there were no audience questions, but again, thank you, and hopefully uh, we're happy to chat afterward. Yes, see you.